Welcome to the Bio Balance Healthcast, episode number 401. We're going to be talking today about the four types of depression. BioBalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of BioBalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Dr. Maupin and Brett are the authors of The Secret Female Hormone, the seminal work about hormone replacement therapy for women, which is available on Amazon or from Dr. Maupin's office at BioBalance Health. Dr. Maupin's office is currently accepting new patients. When um, I began practice, the new antidepressants called SSRIs mm -hmm. that increased serotonin right. and made people not depressed was a panacea. It came out and everybody had to be on it. Everybody wanted to be on Prozac. It was a miracle drug. Yeah, it was a new stuff. It replaced the MAOI inhibitors, the primary yeah. antidepressant, and, and it replaced the tricyclic drugs. And those two drugs are really difficult to be on because you can't eat certain foods and there are so many different risks. Side effects, yeah. And side effects. So, so most of us didn't prescribe them because as primary care, which was what I was considered right. as an OBGYN, we didn't feel comfortable prescribing them. So for, for somebody who was suicidal, we would send them to a psychiatrist and we wouldn't treat them ourselves. But when the SSRIs came out, the side effect profile was very low. And, and we learned about these literally, not from a book, not from a lecture, not from a conference. The drug reps would come in and say, here, here's a new thing. And you just give them this dose. And, and it was like one size fits all and everybody's happy and they don't lose, they don't gain weight. It was kind of, it's non-addictive. It, it, and, and it increases serotonin. And then they told us serotonin was when serotonin's low in your brain, that makes you depressed. And that was like the only kind of depression they talked about. Right. So, so we all jumped on the bandwagon. Because SSRI is serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Which, it's a way to regulate the amount of serotonin that stays in what's called a synaptic cleft. Mm -hmm. the, the, between two nerves. The, yeah, the gap between two nerves. And it's filled with liquid. And messages, chemical and electronic messages, go from the end of one set of nerves over to the receptor side mm -hmm. on the next set. And the medium that they swim through is primarily serotonin. Mm -hmm. That's how they, that's their communication. Mm -hmm. So there's serotonin in your brain, there's mm -hmm. dopamine in your brain, there's epinephrine and norepinephrine in your brain, there's also endorphins in your brain. They're mm -hmm. all chemicals that communicate different things. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was in medical school so many years ago, it was 40 years ago. It was like having a channel selector. Yeah, but you know, they told us channels. it was an electricity. It was electricity. Yeah. It was just like an electrical charge. It w but that's not that's not water and that's not fluid. That's actually just ions going between two points. It's not electricity. It's actually a chemical that's that oh, yeah. is bathing each well, one of it, your nerves. It's the way nerve signals transmit. There's a if this is a link of nerve there are chemicals that go along this length and they're heavy on this end because this is where the receptor site is and they come to that and it absorbs them. Then it transmits down the length and it tilts to the other end mm -hmm. and falls off that and swims through the synaptic cleft and to the next receptor stimulates site, the next picks it up. And so that's how they work. And this is sodium and potassium ions mm -hmm. that balance and go across and they, they spasm. And, and when they spasm, it shifts and the ions fall off mm -hmm. into the synaptic cleft, and swim across again. the gap, and get reabsorbed like a sponge just soaks it in. You're talking kind of like a circuit. But if you if you block this receptor site, mm -hmm. then they just sit out here, and they and don't they keep, go anywhere. But they keep communicating. That's, yes. They keep in communicating the in the gap. So it's like you have more... Like static on your radio. It's like you have more, elect, more serotonin than you really have. Mm -hmm. So... That, that's the way I look at it. It's, it's just building up serotonin between these two nerves. So you feel better because serotonin generally makes you feel not depressed. I mean, depression is very complicated. Everybody describes it differently. And there are four types, and I'm categorizing them not as how patients necessarily act, but what neurotransmitters they're missing. Because I believe in, in, in the theory and the belief that you're missing a chemical in your brain that causes you to have what we consider psychiatric 
or psychological problems mm -hmm. and to not feel whole or normal. Well, and patients aren't going to know that. As a physician they don't need who to studies know that. this stuff, they don't need to know that. I come in and sit down and say, I'm depressed. And you say, well, tell me about it. And I say, well, the, nothing excites me. Nothing interests me. I have no energy for anything. I just, it, it's too much trouble to get up. Even, even people that are suicidal, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a pendulum swing. Mm -hmm. And as I go down in the depths of depression and I'm suicidal, when I'm at my most suicidal, I don't have the energy. If there was a gun on the table over there, I don't have the energy to get up and go over there and pick it up. I sit here and think about it and say, well, yeah, that's, that's what I would do, but I don't go do it. Where they become at risk is when they start to come back up mm -hmm. and they're still depressed. Mm -hmm. Then, When they're they, getting better. When they're getting better, then they have an energy mm -hmm. surge, and that is the point at which you really need to be supervising and available to make an intervention, which is why they right. put people in the hospital on a suicide watch. So they can right. be supervised for, for that swing point. So that that's the point where they're likely to cross the room, pick up the gun, and hurt themselves. So somebody who is depressed and suicidal yeah. who has a loss of serotonin, because we, I, I need to know that because I need to know what to treat the patient with. Mm -hmm. You may need to know that because you may have been on one antidepressant and mm -hmm. felt like it wasn't working and maybe you needed a whole different family of antidepressants that worked on a different neurotransmitter, which is why we're talking about it today. Right. So if somebody was suicidal because of a lack of serotonin, right. then they are, um, what would what would they feel like? They'd feel like they were worrying, obsessing, trouble sleeping, and they'd feel a lot of, of pain, like physical pain. They would complain about aches, not so much like sharp pains, but pervasive achiness. And pain and psychological pain. And psychological life's too pain. pain. So they would Life say, life's too painful. Hurts. Yeah. I can't go on because it's right. too painful. Right. So that would be something somebody with a lack of serotonin would say. And then you'd say, so what do you crave to eat? Just to and they'd say, "What are you talking to me about that for? I just told you I was suicidal." No, well, let's go. Let's back up. Just say, "No, no, I'm serious." You at some point you have to ask that question, yeah. and they're going to look at you and go, "Why are you asking me that?" <laughs> I know, but, How, but how's that relevant? But to there the are certain foods yeah. that actually can, can are the building blocks for serotonin. So if you need more serotonin, and in your brain you're going to crave certain foods, and it's carbohydrates, mm -hmm. bananas. Let's see. I I have to actually always look them up look when the I'm list. You do. You looking need to have at a my checklist. list. Right. So um, let's see. It's Pine not apples? and dairy. Dairy. Dairy stuff. So cheese, cheese, cheese. Oh, cheese! I or, crave ice cream all the time. Yeah, Does that and mean ice I'm cream? depressed? <laughs> and well, <laughs> I didn't know. It, it actually is a thing I That's crave not, when I am depressed. Well, yeah. if somebody's depressed. Those are things that they crave right. because of the serotonin. Because my body is telling me we need more of this and stuff. And that's why with, with depression from lack of serotonin, when you eat all that stuff, you gain weight and you get more depressed. It's so, a vicious cycle. Yeah, it is. So so it's better for you to take a medication that would improve your serotonin than to take all to overeat these very uh, high calorie and high carbohydrate. Right, because you may eat a thousand grams of something and only get usefulness out of two grams. Right. You know, that's, that's not. <laughs> but the then way you're going to gain a lot two. of weight yeah, over the and time. Yeah, all the negative costs of the other. So, uh, but there are some supplements that you can take, not in lieu of your medication, but with your medication. Mm -hmm. So to help with serotonin, we usually use 5-HT, which is stimulates tryptophan, which helps you sleep. Because that's a problem is sleeping, is not being yes. able to sleep. Right. Magnesium, because that is a, a rela muscle relaxant. We use B-complex. B vitamins are what are contained in wheat and grains. So instead of having so you eat related. all the carbs, you right. take the B vitamins instead. Zinc and SAME, S-A-M-E, which is, is um, a, uh, how do I describe that? Uh, it, it's a chemical that actually um, I thought, helps. I thought it was same. It's Sammy. <laughs> they say, I mean, it's. I think I didn't capitalize it little, properly. No, so I'm it, just saying I, I don't know what it is. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a chemical that helps you uh, process your tryptophan. And then um, St. John's wort it is actually does work for some types of serotonin depression. Yeah. But that's, that's the things that... We think about, and we should, if we're treating depression along with whatever else we're treating. Okay, can, can I talk about a pet peeve? Yes. 
as a clinician talking to people suffering from these issues, I would encounter people that would come in and say, oh, I'm taking St. John's Ward. Right. And they buy it over the Internet. And they buy it from God knows where it's And we don't know made. what's in it. It's not a consistent production or a consistent dosage. And we don't know what's in there besides mm-hmm. St. John's Ward. If you're going to take things like this, then you need to be talking to your physician about where do I get regulated, uh, pure, dependable pure yes. supplements. And, and, and also... Medical grade is what we say. If you're the kind of person that talks to somebody in the grocery store and they say, oh, my sister's taking St. John's Ward and she's just wonderful. For God's sake, don't get medical advice from some idiot on a street corner. If you're seriously (laughs) suffering from a concern that requires some professional intervention, go to the professionals, find out what they know. See what you think about how that works before you try what the mailman's sister's brother well, a lot of learned those, at I the mean, gas station. They're just like medicines. In in the wrong hands for the wrong thing, they can make you much worse. Absolutely. So you don't want to be doing that. You don't want to be taking something for a depression caused by low serotonin when you have low dopamine. I mean, <laughs> it's not the same thing. It That's what we're trying to delineate. It's, yes. It's a different, whole different chemical And profile. we're learning more. I mean, the, the part of the point of the conversation is 30 years ago, this information wasn't available. We it was didn't trial know. It and was error. A, was, well, actually, Kathy and I were talking about this before we started the, the camera. When you see a thousand patients a year and 300 of them are suffering from depression, you build a sense, what, what in my profession mm-hmm. we call the unthought known. Mm-hmm. You build an accumulated weight of information based on the experience of the people that you see that that guide you in your treatment protocols. Mm-hmm. It, it says, more of my people are getting better when we do this, mm-hmm. so let's it's do true. more of this. And that's not necessarily in a document that you got from the FDA or a class that you took in college. Mm-hmm. It's just part of the experience of the practice practicing of medicine. professionally. Yes. Yeah. Practice of medicine, practice of law does the same thing. Yes. So you, they write up things that worked, that didn't, don't do this again. Right. You know, so we would do the same thing. At first, all we had was Prozac, and then they added Zoloft, and then they added all these other yeah. serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And then it was a little dicey. What do we do? Do we, you know, do we use this one? And then it was just, if that doesn't Trial work, we error. use another. We use another until we... Or we, whatever would, the most recent drug salesman handed you and said, right. this is the best stuff. This is the new stuff. Right. I think my mentality was different then. Because yeah. I was so busy, yeah. and I had so little time to research anything. Well, tell the it story was, about your difficult. patient that was in pain and was depressed, and one of his manifestations was that he was feeling a lot of aches and pains. So he he was um, he was an al- the one that is an alcoholic. Yes. Mm-hmm. So he he's a, uh, a successfully treated alcoholic who doesn't drink, and he had a hormone imbalance. I treated that. That made him a little better, but not as much better as it usually makes people. Mm-hmm. Then um, we tre- I treated his, uh, or his family doctor changed his antidepressant because he was still depressed. Testosterone didn't help, and his antidepressant didn't help, and he changed him to a combined dopamine and serotonin reuptake inhibitor, which is Wellbutrin, which is, it's really probably where you start with addict- people who have had addictions, addictions right. because they have... Addiction is a lot, a lack or a low sensitive, excuse me, high sensitivity to dopamine. So, and, and a lack of dopamine. Mm-hmm. So he had had that change, but he still just hurt all over. So our answer to that was that his uh, endorphins were still low. We can't test them, but we have to. We don't currently have we don't, to do that. We don't have a test for that, right. but endorphins are the feel-good hormones. So, I mean, feel-good neurotransmitters. They, they give you, they go to the opiate receptors and fill the opiate receptors and make you feel not in pain. So we did. Is that like a runner's high? Well, endorphins give you a runner's high, mm-hmm. but when. Run, runners, when they run extensively reach a point of pain in their body where there's literally they feel a switch throw yeah. and they feel a sense of euphoria right. and and high energy from the running the running makes their brain make more endorphins mm-hmm. and then the endorphins Saturate make those. them not feel their pain which yeah. is a good and a bad thing we have pain for a reason it's an em- oh. it's an emergency sign a woman that, that you should stop doing past something my house 
that looks like she is in agony. Everybody I see walk across like, my ha- in front of my house, they all look oh like they're gosh. they're in pain. I want to stop her and say, "Honey, you don't there are other answers." But but it's possible they're using these endorphins from running yeah. to solve their depression problem, their yeah. pain oh, yeah, problem, absolutely. their addiction, whatever. It's almost an addiction to running. But the problem so, with addictions is you have to have more and, and more, more and, and more. more of the substance to get the same level of release. Right. And at some point, no matter how much more you take, you can't get a, a level of release. Right. And that has to do with you're, you're born with an addictive chemistry. And when you find that substance that then causes you to feel better, because I think you're low in endorphins to begin with, or you're, you have to be low in endorphins to crave something else to make you feel better. Yeah. So they crave something else, and so they're low on the endorphins. The endorphins then are stimulated by whatever substance they're using, because that, that can be stimulated by opiates, but it also can be stimulated by uh, amphetamines. It also can be stimulated by um, heroin. So all of those things can stimulate the o- opioid receptors. But we don't want to do that. In medicine, we, of course, don't want to give a substance that is going to make somebody need more and more and more. So the answer to this is is the um, is called low dose naltrexone, and we're going to go into detail. We're going to talk about that later. On the next podcast. But low dose naltrexone is um, is like Narcan, what we give to people emergently when they're dying of an opioid overdose. We give them Narcan. Narcan shuts down all the opioid receptors and blocks them so that the patient begins breathing again and and his heart comes back and he doesn't die, hopefully. Hopefully. And in in most emergency, first responders now have that drug and use it. But 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 we're not using that drug. We're using a drug like it, similar to it, called naltrexone, (laughs) and it's low dose. And so how it works is you take a tiny dose before you go to bed, and it blocks your receptors your opioid receptors, and it fools your brain into making more endorphins. So your brain is fooled. The endorphins that make you feel good go up for the whole next day. Then you do it again the next night, but you don't keep craving more and more. It just makes you feel normal. And overloading on carbs and gaining weight. Right, and you don't do these other things that make you you worse, but this helped this patient. We we talked about uh, four types of depression. Mm-hmm. We talked about serotonin deficiency. Mm-hmm. We've talked about dopamine deficiency, mm-hmm. epinephrine, norepinephrine, uh, endorphin deficiency, but you also have listed hormone deficiencies. And that's Let's kind of a the fifth. On that. yeah. That's the fifth because there's, um, when we treat patients with depression, oftentimes they can decrease the dose of their antidepressants if we give testosterone. Mm-hmm. So when we give testosterone pellets, it it elevates the level of to a certain point, endorphins, dopamine, uh, and, and oxytocin. And oxytocin. Yeah. But but it stimulates oxytocin. Oxytocin gives you that feeling of bonding or loving or or it's like a familial hormone. We call the hormone, it feel good hormone. Yeah, 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 it's one of the feel good hormones. Yeah. You know, and it's also the it's also the um, uh, climax hormone. So it is Here one of go. those. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, ergo, it makes you feel better. Yeah. So this is one of the hormones. Testosterone leads to um, oxytocin, also can lead to prolactin, and a small surge of prolactin can also intensify uh, climax or orgasm. And, and But then prolactin also causes you to have, like, a resting period in between sessions of, of sex. But, but these are also hormonal neurotransmitters, that actually help all of your other chemical transmitters become normal. Not high, not low, but normal. Yeah. So, so. Part, part of the reason we're having this conversation and the next one that we're going to have is to say that there are new understandings about the cause, the existence, the treatment for depression mm-hmm. that have evolved over the last 10 or 15 years. More and more is being learned. Better treatments are being derived. Many, many people suffer from depression in part because we live in such a high-stress environment. And stress burns out some of your your brain chemistry. 
And, and so we're learning more about chemistry and brain chemistry in particular, the neurotransmitters, the endorphins, the synaptic cliff, all that stuff. We also have all this stuff in our environment that's blocking the our toxins. Uh, the toxins that are yes. blocking our receptors in our brain from our neurotransmitters. Even if we're making them, we don't feel them because you can make them, but if they can't get accepted at this end of the of the line, it doesn't do anything. So, so that's we also have, that's part of that cleansing thing and getting healthier. Yes, and so we're learning more about it. We want you to know more about it, and we want you to know some of the specifics so that you can search for what would be beneficial to you or recognize things that you can talk to your doctor about. Come back for the next podcast when we talk about low-dose naltrexone mm -hmm. and, and the new information that we're learning about it. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.